I am uh, Om Srivastav. I am visiting professor of infectious diseases and director department of infectious diseases at Just Look Hospital, Mumbai. There are there are a combination of reasons. One is our own conduct, approach and understanding of infectious diseases where we tend to use, misuse, abuse antibiotics in situations where they are either not required, not necessary or they are given for reasons that is inappropriate to patients. That means not just, not just in ICUs, in hospitals but also in the community. You are when you or you or any, any person goes to your local chemist and says, I have a fever, the chemist in good faith gives you an antibiotic. That antibiotic may or may not be required and that's when you start to begin your resistance. That is one of the biggest reasons. The other is, like I said, we, we tend to give antibiotics where it may not be required in a hospital, in situations where if you have a viral infection, you are given an antibiotic which is going to treat a bacterial infection. That's another uh, 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 common, common problem. The third is the kind of population density that we have in our country, where it is, uh, it is difficult. For instance, if you are having, say, tuberculosis, and that you're traveling in a local train, or uh, you're traveling point A to point B, in a place where the, the compartment is jam-packed, every time you cough when you're having an active tubercular disease, every time you cough, you are giving every other person in that compartment to get the infection that you're carrying. So tuberculosis is one. Viral infections like H1N1, you know, what was earlier called swine flu, and a number of other conditions where if you are infected, you are passing on your secretions, your body fluids, in a public place that is going to almost certainly infect others. And this second person is going to pass on the infection to a third, fourth, fifth, a hundredth, hundredth person. So we tend to, we are not able to grasp at the level of the common man. I am not talking about people who are, who are, uh, you know, white collar workers uh, in, in, in offices or hospitals. I am talking about the common people who probably disregard a number of these very important aspects of infectious diseases just because they need to keep going to work on a daily basis because that is how they are trained to think and that if you are unwell you go to your local doctor who gives you a combination of some medications that may or may not help you. So why is infectious disease the biggest killer? Infectious disease is, is in, in a large part misunderstood or partially understood and that the approach that you need to take when you get chest pain your first reaction is go to your emergency or your doctor to see a cardiologist. We are not yet there in our understanding of infectious diseases to say, if you've got a fever, there is a way to approach it and that you must go there. And whether it is your local doctor or it is the local hospital or emergency, you need to have that kind of understanding that mismanaging a fever is something that will give consequences not only for you, but for you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people uh, without you actually realizing that you're doing yourself a great deal of harm and you're harming a lot of other people. So if you look at the, the timeline of, you know, simply the antibiotics, uh, just about five years ago, you know, uh, every infection had, every infection that requires the high-end antibiotic in a hospital, in an ICU, there used, to be, there used to be at least half a dozen options, maybe even more. But in the last about three years time, two years time or thereabouts, uh, you'll find that the total number of options have dwindled to one or maybe two antibiotics, if you're lucky, if you're lucky. Uh, why, are we, why are we running out of options? Uh, as I was just saying a little while ago, we are using and misusing a number of these things so that they, 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 we were not cognizant of the fact that if you, if you misuse or abuse an antibiotic, what is going to happen to the next patient? You have nothing left for the next patient. That is one. The second aspect is that in, in terms of antibiotics that are likely to be available in the foreseeable future, uh, the, the, the cupboard is threadbare. It's threadbare. It's, we are probably going to get a new antibiotic in, you know, once every three, four, five years, not, not earlier than that. And that in doing that, what is going to happen to those patients who have, who have uh, 
so for instance if you have a urinary tract infection if you had one just about five years ago you could treat these patients as an outpatient you know give them an oral medication or give them something to take you know uh, an injection in their own homes now in less than five years time these patients who get this kind of infections you watch them slowly die in a hospital over a period of 15 days 20 days because there is no antibiotic that is working so one part one major part is that we don't have options two is that in the options available we are misusing them and three is we are not responsible enough to say that the next patient needs to have something that we can offer to them otherwise the next patient is simply going to die before our eyes out of a common chest infection or a urine infection or something like that so I'm, I'm very happy to, to share with you that Just Look Hospital now has, uh, under the Department of Infectious Diseases, uh, it has two isolation beds. Isolation facilities require very stringent, very, very careful kind of facilities to be given. For instance, the kind of filters that you have in the air conditioning, the kind of flooring that you have, the, the kind of... Uh, facilities that you're going to provide, the training you're going to provide to the nursing staff and doctors to get rid of samples or body fluids like sputum or urine or stool or needles which are coming out of infected patients. How to get rid of them and how to make sure that you're not passing an infection simply because you're looking after an infected patient. All of that is, is critical in, in running an isolation facility. So. If you've, got a, if you've got a very aggressive virus which is affecting a patient's lungs, that patient who comes in this isolation facilities is going to be treated in a very different manner so that everybody is safe, not just the patient but the nursing staff, doctors, the lab technicians and we are going to be ensuring that this kind of safety is followed stringently. That applies to everybody, it doesn't have any exceptions and in doing that you will be able to break the cycle of infections from going from one person to another person because that is probably the most important part in transmission of an infection. When I say that you will infect you know, 500 people in, in a train station or a compartment or an airport, you need to be able to break the cycle and that the isolation facility that I'm talking about is one that breaks the cycle so that infected patients will not transmit the infection to other people, whether they are lay people or hospital staff. And so we are looking at implementing this kind of procedure very stringently and having good successful outcomes. We've, we've, we've done that earlier and this is isolation facility of 2019. Uh, we are looking at making this a point of you know, care, which is at the best standards of infectious diseases anywhere in the world. I think that's, that, that's a very good aspect you're talking about. So policy makers both in, uh, in private health setups, in hospital setups and in public health setups uh, need, to be having, uh, need to be having very strict policies. But the point again of the policy is that once you've written a policy, you've got to find out how to implement it because otherwise that's a good policy on paper and policies on paper have to be put into practice. So yes, uh, you know, with the airborne infections, that means that are coming out of your droplets of, uh, you know, sputum or lung secretions, waterborne infections that are going to be affecting your gut. So people who are having uh, things like diarrheal diseases or gut infections and uh, urine infections in the community, all of that need to be handled in a way so that people who are infected are not going to be passing on this infection to to other people in the community and that needs to be that needs to be addressed in a policy that is practical that is implementable and that you can see the results that in doing this in your policy you have been able to make a difference in the in the incidence of infections in the community